a few weeks ago, I requested prayer for me uh, that you, I would continue to grow spiritually so that I would be able to feed you uh, fresh things so that you can continue to grow. And the reason I asked for that is because I have been reading a book that challenged me that uh, people are not going to grow any taller spiritually than their spiritual leaders. And so I have to uh, continue to stretch. And so I'm asking you to continue to pray for that. So in a way, there's the beginning of the answer to prayer here. Uh, I just need to frame this just a little bit. Um, normally, at the beginning of each quarter, I will give Chris a list of verses that I'm going to be preaching from for the next 13 weeks. And then she's able to put out that list so that people can sign up and read. And they know well in advance what they're going to read. I know well in advance what I'm going to preach. Well, this time around, I quieted myself before God and asked him, so what do you want me to do in these 13 weeks? And nothing would come. Um, in fact, I received a clear word from the Lord, don't plan anything yet. Which was hard for me because I like to plan. I like to have my ducks in a row and, and we sort of disagree. But it's, it really is true, at least in certain contexts. And I'd like to be able to tell myself that, okay, I've got a plan. I've got a direction. We're headed this way. It takes the pressure off of me to think. Um, but I did. I backed off, and I didn't give Chris anything. And then uh, this past week, somebody gave me a book called God Guides. It's actually just a booklet, and I started reading it, and... As I was reading it, it came to my attention what I should be doing over the next few weeks. And I don't know how long it's going to be going. I'm taking it a week at a time. Um, but at least I know that we are going to be learning about hearing God's voice and listening to him. This is a, a difficult thing, and yet it's something that's supposed to come naturally. It's something that I was even doing prior to my learning about this, but I'm finding that I'm still very much a novice. And so I need to grow in my ability to hear God so that I can share what I have learned with you. So this is what I am sharing right now, what I have learned in this past week about listening to God. First of all, I want to tell you that God speaks. Now, primarily, he speaks through the Bible the Word of God. That is a record of how God has spoken throughout the ages. Psalm 1830 says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. And in Psalm 119, 105, we read, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So when I grew up in a Baptist church, the mantra was, God has spoken. And that word is authoritative, and we need to abide by it. And that is true. However, it is also true that God speaks. Now, I want to be careful about what I say here when I say that God speaks, because there are some things that we need to understand about it. Um, I don't often talk about denominations, but I feel like I can because this church used to be part of the United Church of Christ. And the United Church of Christ actually has as its motto, God speaks. What they're talking about is to contextualize. You need to put into it the, the modern context what God said long ago. So he may have said some things about homosexuality or some other things, that really were true back then, but don't really fit today. So God is speaking something new today. That's not what I'm talking about. We should be able to test the Spirit to see that if they really are from God, because God will never contradict himself. In fact, the Apostle Paul warned the church in Galatia that if, if he or anybody else or even an angel were to present to them a gospel that is different from the one that Paul had preached, they will be accursed. 
So you get an idea of what my mantle is, my yoke, that I need to preach the gospel of Christ faithfully because I don't want to be cursed. But you also need to adhere to it. And you need to be able to test it. And if somebody preaches something from this pulpit that is contrary to the word of God, you need to be able to confront them about that. But that is not to say that God does not speak. God will speak to us as we quiet ourselves before him, but he'll never contradict his word. And I wanted to just remind you of some of those very specific things that he's already revealed to us that we should be doing. This is from a flyer that I created for the church called Specific Commands from uh, Scripture. I had given this to you probably several years ago, but I, and I have a copy or two if you still want one. But some of the commands that we are already told that we're supposed to do, feed the hungry, give a drink to the thirsty, take in strangers, give clothing to those who need it, visit the sick and the imprisoned. That's from Matthew chapter 25, verses 35 to 36. We're supposed to witness to others about Jesus, Acts 1.8. We're supposed to honor our father and mother, Ephesians 6.2. We're supposed to confess our sins to one another and pray for one another so that we might be healed. That's James 5.16. So you get the idea. As we expose ourselves to Scripture, we begin to see very clearly what the will of God is for us. And he's not going to reveal anything new to us if we're not doing what's already revealed. So that's the principle that I want to talk to you about when, we, uh, when, I, when I talk about God speaking. Based upon the scriptures that Steve and I read this morning, I'd like to share some truths about hearing God. The first truth that I'd like to mention is uh, that of distractions. Distractions occur um, in our day. They're a little bit different than what Elijah experienced. I think in, if we're going to really understand the passage Steve read, I'm going to have to tell you a little story, okay? Elijah was a prophet in the Old Testament. He was a unique prophet. Uh, prior to him, miracles were relatively rare. And after him, he had a, a, a servant whose name was Elisha, who even had performed greater miracles than Elijah. But after those two men died, really no miracles happened within the Old Testament um, after, I would say, the conquering of, uh, the conquering of Israel. Now, yes, God did work, and he caused battles to be won. He caused a man to die when he touched the Ark of the Covenant. But what I'm talking about is amazing signs, signs of God's power. One of the signs that, that Elijah performed, because he lived in, in Israel, and Ahab was king. Ahab was what, probably the worst king that Israel ever had. He turned the entire country away from worshiping God, the true God, and started having them worship Baals. He married a woman named Jezebel, and uh, that name Jezebel, even today, uh, carries a connotation of wickedness. Jezebel and Ahab started to persecute the true believers, and the prophets especially that stood up to them and told them what they were doing was wrong, they were putting to the sword and killing them. And so God told Elijah to pray in front of Ahab, and so Elijah did, and he said, not going to rain anymore until I say so. And then he ran away, and he hid. And it didn't rain one drop for three years. Can you imagine? The place had become a desert. <coughs> Only the king's horses and cows and cattle had any kind of food or water. Everybody else was decimated. And people were crying out. And Ahab, he was blaming Elijah thinking he was the one that troubled Israel, but it was he himself. Well, after three years, God told Elijah to confront Ahab. So he did. He went before Ahab, and he said, we are now going to hold a contest. We're going to find out who the true God really is. We're going to go onto the mountain, and we're going to put up two altars, one for Baal and one for Yahweh, God. And we're going to find out who the true God is. The one who brings down fire from heaven will be the true God. So he let the Baals go first, Baal worshipers. And they prayed to their God, and they started cutting themselves and dancing all around, thinking that Satan would somehow wake up their God so that he would do this. 
And of course, nothing happened all day long. Elijah started to mock them. And then finally, it was his turn. And he told them, well, before you do this, I want you to dig a trench around the altar. So they dug a trench. And then he said, I want you to pour water on the altar. Now remember, it hadn't rained in three years. And here he is telling them to pour water on the altar. Precious water. But they did it. And then Elijah prayed a simple prayer. And then God sent fire right down and consumed not only the, the meat that was on the altar, but the altar itself and all the water that was around it. And then all the people, they stood up and they cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And then Elijah told the people to grab the Baal worshippers and have them killed immediately so that they would not be able to continue to pollute the people of Israel. So they did that. And then God told Elijah to confront Jezebel directly. So Elijah went to Jezebel. But instead of cowering before him, Jezebel said, May the same thing happen to me and worse if you're not like those prophets by tomorrow morning. And instead of standing up like God told him to, Elijah ran away. He was scared to death. And that was the context in which we found him in this passage. He went all the way out as far as he could go, fell under a tree, and was about to die. An angel of the Lord came, gave him some food, revived him. And in that revival, he went 40 days and 40 nights without eating anything, just wandering about in the desert until he got to Mount Horeb. And it was there that the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. So, Elijah's distractions were the earthquake, the fire, the wind. I think if he lived today, he would have had different distractions. His distractions would have been excessive busyness or electronic devices, or political processes. But God was not in those. I find myself distracted by these things. I'm writing a sermon, and then all of a sudden I get a, I get a message at the bottom of my screen telling me that my best friend has posted something on Facebook. Well, what do I want to do? I want to stop preparing my message and instead look on Facebook. It's a distraction. If you have those, I would recommend go low tech. Get rid of your, your screen and just use a Bible. That will allow you to avoid that kind of a distraction. In James, we hear about doubt as a, a, an inhibitor to hearing God's voice. James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. And to be honest, this is where my biggest stumbling block was. I kept asking myself, well, how do I know that what I'm really hearing is, in fact, the voice of God and not something else? Well, in a few minutes, I'll share some things that might help you with that because they have helped me as well. But doubt can prevent us from hearing God's word and acting on it. And then I'd like to share something about the divine. You see, Jesus is the good shepherd, and we do hear his voice. He says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus, of course, is talking about the Jews who are his, but then he also talks about the other flock, the Gentiles, you and me, if we're not Jewish, who uh, then come to believe in him. And we hear his voice, and we become one flock. So it is possible, and it's in fact necessary, for us to hear the voice of God. 